Well, my wife and I had the privilege um, the last uh, week and a half to do some traveling, and um, that one song mentioned mountains and oceans, and we got to see them both. We tr- drove east into the mountains of Pennsylvania and uh, did some history, uh, history hiking around Gettysburg, and then we spent uh, a day, about 24 hours on the beach at Ocean City, New Jersey, and then we did some more history stuff in Philadelphia and did the Amish country, Pennsylvania Dutch, and uh, spent one more day, part of a day, in Milwaukee before we came back to our home, home soil. And it was good to be home. But uh, this, this psalm kind of uh, comes out of that vacation because as we looked and saw God's creation on display, as we heard the music of the surf and uh, the bird song every morning in the Pennsylvania woods and uh, saw God's creation on display, uh, it reminded me of this psalm. And um, this is a psalm that I, I just... I'm in awe every time I I read it because when we read this psalm, we go on a trip with David. I'm not saying saying David was on a trip when he wrote it, by the way. (laughs) But he took a trip in his mind. He took a journey from the infinite, awesome depths of space right back to his own heart before God. And this psalm encompasses that distance and shows how God has bridged the gap between his awesome, transcendent creator power and us as humble human beings. And so I'm going to take you on that trip. I'm going to be your guide today as we, as we take every step along the way that David takes in this psalm. And first we're going to read it together. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out unto the, into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from its pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So as David begins this journey, um, can you go back to the first slide? I just want you to picture 
David, uh, the title slide, if you would. Yeah. I want you to picture David uh, tending the sheep. <laughs> David, David was just a shepherd. You remember how he started out? He was the youngest of his brothers. His dad gave him the most menial task that was available, and that was tending the sheep. And his brothers were out fighting battles, and he was back with the, you know, out in the pasture. And uh, so he had the job of being out there day and night protecting the flock. It was a big, a big responsibility, kind of a thankless job. And he was, much of the time, he was alone. And uh, we, we understand David as a shepherd when we read the psalm that we're going to read next week, Psalm 23, because it's the shepherd's psalm. But it comes from the heart of a shepherd. And that's what David was. A shepherd was responsible 24-7 for the flock. And at night, while he's protecting the flock, he's got them gathered probably in, in some kind of an enclosure. He's trying to stay alert. He's probably getting his sleep during the day, and he's awake at night, and he's in, in Palestine, which is basically a desert much of the year. And he's looking out at an unclouded, clear, crystal clear, no city lights, no street lights, no light pollution. <laughs> and he's looking out at the Milky Way. And he's seeing the moon rise over the Judean mountains. And he's, he's seeing the sun rise in all its glory the next morning. And he makes a statement to begin this psalm that, that should be startling to us in the day we live in, at least. The heavens declare the glory of God. In other words, the heavens speak. They're making a statement. And he, he doesn't just say that once. He repeats it several times in diff several, several different ways. The heavens declare, the skies proclaim. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. So the heavens, and by inference, all of God's creation, is communicating with us. The marginal notes in my Bible say, the silent heavens speak. I find that, that really profound. I've never heard a, a star speak to me, although scientists say there is, there is sort of a, a weird cosmic noise coming in from the stars. We can't hear it with our ears. But, but when you look up at the night sky, you should be getting a message. When you see a cardinal perched on a branch by your bird feeder, you should be getting a message. When you, when you see a hummingbird hover, hovering right next to the feeder, motionless, but in rapid motion, you should be getting a message. The psalmist says, the heavens speak. All of creation, but here specifically the sky, communicates the glory, the power, the provision, and the intelligence of its creator. And, and make no mistake here, David is not ambiguous about whether God is creator here. The heavens are not to be worshipped. The heavens are not the object of our worship. They draw our mind and our heart to the, uh, the true object, object of worship, which is their creator. We live in a world that's confused about that, largely through the influences of Eastern uh, thought and Eastern religion, uh, something called polytheism or pantheism has, has kind of invaded America over the last several decades. And in that view, if, if this is the universe, as ever, everything in this circle is the universe, God is in the circle. God is, God is just part of the universe. 
In fact, some would say God is the universe. The universe is alive, and that life is God. The Bible has a whole different view of God. If this is the universe, God is out here. God is the one who is creating and sustaining this universe. He is not part of the universe. He is outside of it. Now, he's inside of it, too. He's, he's everywhere. But he is not a projection of the universe. He is the maker of the universe. From the greatest supernova to the tiniest atom, God made it all. He is not dependent on it. He is not a projection of it. He is separate and infinitely sovereign. And everything we see in the universe displays his knowledge, his power, his intelligence, his glory, his awesomeness. I would add that this view of God as creator has its own name for God. Whenever you read the word God in most of the Old Testament, you're reading the word Elohim. Elohim is the creator God. He is, he is the God who started and did everything, who, who wove the universe together, who spoke it into being. The communication that I talk about, that we see and hear in, the, in everything around us from nature, from the creation, the psalmist says it's continuous. This, conti this uh, communication is continuous. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. So th this is an ongoing process. There is, there is never a time that the message is not being proclaimed to the, to the world, to, to humanity, to anyone with eyes to see that God is God, that his glory is above the heavens. Not only is that communication continuous, it is also universal. Their voice, there is no speech or language where their voice is not heard, verse 3. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. So th this idea of universal communication is there. It's continuous and it's universal. It's every day and it's everywhere for all to see. I'd like you to, just, now this is not just an Old Testament idea. This is not just David's idea. I want you to read with me from Romans uh, 1, verses 19 and 20. He's talking about people all over the world here who have denied that God exists or live as though he doesn't exist. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. This idea of a self-evident creator that God is on full display for anyone with eyes to see is not just an, an Old Testament idea. It, it's something that rings right through the New Testament. It was an obvious thing for any Jew. It was an obvious thing for any God-fearing Greek, that, that the God of the universe was self-evident. I think it's really interesting that we live in a world, archaeologists or uh, anthropologists have gone to every culture. I don't know that I've heard recently of a, of a group of human beings, 
however primitive, that have not now been contacted. When I was a, when I was a young man, I, my brother worked with Wycliffe Bible translators in the jungles of Peru, and while, while I was down there visiting him for a year and a half, helping out, they came across a, tri- a tribe called um, the Nawas, yeah. And they called themselves the Nawas, which just means people in their language. They thought they were the only people in the world because they had never met anybody outside of their little valley out in the, in the jungle of the Amazon. And somehow some uh, uh, miners or gold prospectors had come in contact with this tribe, given it a terrible case of the flu or possibly just the common cold, and these people were dying one after the other because of our germs that they had never encountered before. And some of these people were so ill, and they were just young people. They were young, healthy people, they, but they had no immune system. They were flown into the center where I was staying, and I visited them one day, and I remember I had, a, had on a shirt, a T-shirt of some kind, and, and I walked in, and of course I was huge, and they were little, and, and the guy looked at me, and, and he, he pointed at me, and he said something, and the translator said, he would like your shirt. <laughs> well, one of the things about this tribe was that they had, no, they had no concept of or value for private property. Everything was communal. And the, the sign of leadership in that, in that tr- culture was that the leader, the, the chief, was the one who was most willing to give away anything that he possessed to anyone else who asked for it. I found that very interesting. My point here is the Nawa, without any contact with anyone else anywhere, had a high God. They had a God who made everything. They didn't know much about him, but they knew he was ultimately in charge. They had an Elohim. They didn't call him Elohim, but he had the same function as that word in Hebrew. He was the creator. They could not account, they could not imagine a universe, the world, the, the, the jungle, the intricacies they saw around them in the Amazon without a creator. I don't know that there is anywhere in the world that a tribe has been encountered who is innately atheist. There's no such thing as primitive atheists. Anyone with common sense and eyes to see looks around at the universe and says, there is a creator. That's what Paul is saying here. That's what David is saying. The universe is speaking to us. It's only a lot of education that can get rid of, and I'm not anti-education, by the way, but education that misses the big picture. And that's what I'm afraid a lot of science does today. Science looks at, C.S. Lewis put it really well. He said, imagine you walk into a barn and all the windows are closed up and the only light is coming through a chink in the ceiling of the barn and it's a ray of sunlight coming into this dark barn, and all you see is the dust. Every, every barn is dusty. <laughs> is the dust is suspended in the air, swirling. All these millions of little particles swirling in the sunlight. What science does is it picks out one little particle at a time, and it examines it. And it says, okay, what is it that keeps it floating there? And what is it that that composes this little particle? And science sees all the little particulars, but doesn't ask, what is that sun that's illuminating that? What is the light that makes it beautiful? What is the miracle of, of its existence at all? 
I feel like science is missing the forest for the trees, and I'm not anti-science. I just believe science isn't telling the whole story or giving us any perspective on how the world and the universe we live in is possible without a creator. In verse 7, I'm sorry, in verse 4, he makes a little brief, brief uh, detour to talk about the sun. The sun is part of God's creation. It is a, it is a created thing. It's not, it is not God, but it reminds David of God. And every bit of the language he uses about the sun here is, is um, full of majesty, is full of dignity. It, it, is, it is deliberate, it's powerful, it is majestic. The sun comes forth like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion on the day of his wedding, dressed in all of his finery, beautiful, powerful. And it goes across the heavens like, like a runner, like a champion rejoicing to run its race. Uh, it's a picture of majesty. It's a picture of deliberate power. And in that sense, the, the sun is an image of its creator. It is an illustration of its creator. So those blanks there are, the sun uh, is an illustration, illustrated by the sun. The heavens are God's creation. The sun is not a god, but rather reflects the glory, majesty, power, and provision of its maker. You ever thought about what would the earth be without the sun? Well, you say, well, it'd be a lot cooler. Yeah, 400 degrees below zero exactly is what it would be. <laughs> Absolute zero, whatever that is. Uh, some of you probably know what that figure is. Um, the, yeah, but the sun would be the, the sun is absolutely imperative for us to have, and it provides us with so much that we have. Uh, it, we would not have any green veg, vegetation without the sun. Agriculture would be impossible. There's so much that the sun does for us in moderation. I think that's another illustration of God's provision. If we were a little closer to the sun or a little further away, we wouldn't exist. And it wouldn't take much of a difference. It's just right. So the sun is an illustration of God's provision and power. Verse 7 brings us to a, a real turning point in this psalm. Remember I said we're on a journey? I'm your tour guide. We're about to take a step into a new room in this museum that we're touring. Uh, this is, this is a, a step out of one kind of revelation into another kind of revelation. God has revealed himself through the, the universe that speaks to us. But he is also, re, and that's called general revelation. He has also revealed himself to us in his word that speaks to us. His word that shows us the details of what he's like. After all, you could imagine a God of the universe who created the universe who is impersonal or unable to communicate with, its, with, with his creation. You can imagine a God who is impersonal, not only impersonal, but evil. You know, ultimately evil. You can imagine a God who didn't care anything about morality or how humans conduct themselves. But in the Word of God, in the Old Testament, in the law, we have a glimpse of a personal yet infinite God who is righteous and good and loving and merciful. So through the, through the, the uh, written word of God, that special revelation we call the Bible, and in David's day, what was called the Torah, or the law, 
we get a lot more detail. God is fleshed out for us. We call that special revelation. David wants, he, he kind of waxes lyrical here. He gets, uh, he gets really poetic in talking about the Old Testament and God's revelation of himself through his word. He has a whole series of adjectives for what the word of God is like. Starting at verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The, the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. I don't know if you've ever heard that put to music, but it, it, you can tell David's a musician because that really, that you could really get behind that with some cool music. And it has been put to music a number of times over, over the centuries. The law of the Lord is perfect, it is trustworthy, it is right, it is radiant, it is pure, it is sure. When he says the law is perfect, I see that as meaning complete. It is completely sufficient. It is inerrant. It is, it is just the way God intends it to be. It is trustworthy. It'll hold up, it'll hold your weight up. You can lean on it. You know, the, the, the uh, Israelites, the, the prophets talked about uh, Israel trying to, to make alliances with the nations around them. And in, in particular, they, he, he talked about their alliances with Egypt. And he said, Egypt is like, like a brittle reed that when you lean on it, the splinters go into your hand. That's a very vivid way of saying you can't really trust them. It'll come back to bite you if you do. That is the exact opposite of what God says about his word. It is trustworthy. You can put your weight on it. It is right. And by that, I would, I would take that to mean fair, righteous, just, it makes sense. It fits together. It treats people with dignity and it encourages people to treat each other with dignity and respect and to see each other as neighbors and to see each other as created in God's image. It is radiant. I think this is my favorite one. He says... Uh, at the end of verse 8, the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Now, what do, you, what do you suppose it means by radiant? How is God's word radiant? Well, I think of that the same way I think of uh, the, that verse from Psalm 119. Thy word is a light, a, a light to my path, a, a lamp, I can't remember, a, light, a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That God's word illuminates because it's like a flashlight. You know, if you're holding a flashlight on a dark night, you're going down a winding path through the woods, you're trying to avoid tree roots and rocks and snakes and whatever else is out there in the woods at night, uh, bears. Uh, you, you, might, you might be out there with your flashlight, but, but really what you need to be is down here with your flashlight, right by your feet. And I was always taught, the word, the word is a light, a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It is, it's not about what's down there. It's, Lord, help me to take the next step. And that, in that sense, God's word is radiant. It's not a searchlight for way out there. It's, it's help for the next step. Now, not that it doesn't give us some big picture 
view of, of what's important on the, big, on the bigger scale, but practically, it's the everyday stuff that really matter to us. David says the, word, the, the, the law of the Lord is pure. And I think of that along with the next one, sure. Uh, I don't know if any of you are or have children who are into forging. We have a son who is, is if he could be born to do anything he wants to do, he would be a blacksmith. And he just went to this big conference, uh, big, they call it the, the Hammer Inn. It's like a drive-in or a, a camp inn. The, all, these, all these forgers come together up in uh, Elk River area, and, and they, they do forging, and they learn about forging, and they bring their families, and, and uh, they camp out. He spent, what, three days there? Something like that. And, uh, but they watch these shows on television about forging steel, heating and reheating and putting an edge on a piece of metal, seeing if it holds, holds its edge, seeing if there's any cracks in it, just hammering it, rehammering it, heating it again, hammering it again, until it's forged into this perfect tool of pure steel. Some, of, some pieces of steel, by the way, for some weapons, are forged they're reheated hundreds of times to achieve the kind of edge, the kind of quality, the kind of purity that, that is required for reliability. And that's what this word brings to mind for me. The word of God is forged in the heat of human experience and generation by generation. It is pure, it is strong, it is steadfast and sure. So he spends all those vocabulary words <laughs> on what the law of the Lord is, and then he talks for just a couple of verses about the worth of the law of the Lord. If the, wor if the law of the Lord, if the word of God is, is that awesome, so perfect and beneficial to us, then what's it worth? And he uses two analogies, two metaphors. It's like gold, and it's like honey. <laughs> now, yeah, those things don't really have much to do with each other, except maybe by, with color a little bit. But gold, and he said, uh, your word is worth more than gold. And he doesn't just say pocket change here. He's not just saying a little bit of gold. He says much fine gold. Gold had, had uh, it still does, measures of quality. Some gold is worth more because it is more pure. David says not only is the Bible worth more than gold, but it's worth more than a lot of very fine gold. In other words, the word of God was meant more to David than all of his wealth. And you can read in, in, uh, in the Old Testament, in Chronicles, about how many tons of gold were delivered to David by tribute every year from surrounding nations. But what really mattered to him was the law of the Lord. That God had spoken to him. That God had revealed himself to him. And then he talks about the word of God being sweeter than honey. Now why would you look at God's word as a, a law, you know, if you want to just see it as law of do and don't, do's and don'ts, uh, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. That's what the commands were. You know, you know the Ten Commandments. No adultery, no idolatry, no coveting, no lying. Why would that be sweet? Why call that sweet? I think David was wise enough to understand that, that when God tells us, no, you shouldn't do this. Don't do this. 
you don't want to do this. He knows it is sweet because when I follow, when I submit to what God has said, when I say, well, he must have a reason for saying that. He must have a reason for saying, don't, don't get into adultery. He must have a reason for saying, don't covet what your neighbor has. Be, be content with what you have. Don't lie to each other. A society built on lies can never be sustained. There are consequences when we break God's law. God's law is as much about how we maintain a quality of life as a people. It is for our protection and our provision as much as it is a prohibition. That's why it's sweet. God has honored us by saying, here's what I require. Here's, what, here's how I made the world. Here's how you should behave to each other. What we see at this point, after David starts comp- contemplating the stars, and then it, he realizes, you know what? God didn't just, isn't just speaking through the heavens. He's also spoken to us as, as a person. He's shown us his personality. And by the way, there's a word, a Hebrew word for God that goes with that too. It's, it's Yahweh, or some of us grew up hearing Jehovah. That's the personal name for God. That's the God, the name of God whereby he called himself when he appeared to Moses at the burning bush. A personal God who speaks to us face to face, who communicates with words we can understand who shows his personality, his desire to have a relationship with us. So David takes that turn in verse 7 and then in verse 12. I see a humbled man responding to God's revelation. A humbled man. And I use that word humbled um, deliberately. I believe that, what, that contemplating the stars, st- contemplating God's creation should humble us. Not before creation, although that, that's not a bad idea either, by the way. <laughs> I, think, I think sometimes we think we've got a better way and we need to be careful that we're not meddling in what God has set up in a certain way. I love, I love it when I hear about farmers who are trying to do a farming in a way that that is honoring to the soil and honoring to the ongoing need to keep the land viable and clean. But, but beyond that, we need to be humbled before the Creator. We need to be humbled before the one who has revealed himself in his word. And David, David obviously is, because his response to looking up and seeing the universe spread out before him on the night sky. His response to thinking about the law of the Lord in all of its perfection is found in those last three verses. Contemplating the stars leads David to meditate. That's what this whole psalm is, really. It's a meditation on the glory of God and how it's been revealed to us. And it progresses from the general or the infinite, the far reaches of the universe, that transcendent God who is greater than the universe, and it progresses all the way down to me. Me, the individual created human being and how I need to respond to God. David goes from contemplating the stars to talking about his own hidden sin. Look at at verse uh, 11. It's it's kind of a transitional verse. He's talking about the law of the Lord God's commands. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great 
reward. Notice he said, uses the word your servant there. This is the first time in the psalm that David has referred to himself. Everything else has been, up until this point, everything is out there. It's all about God's word and God's creation. And it's clear that he's meditating now because he's coming back and he's thinking about, how does that apply to me? How does all of that touch me? To me, that is, that is one of the real miracles of this psalm and one of the examples of, of what we need to do as we come to the word of God, as we experience the world God has made us. That we do not make the mistake of analyzing the word of God or analyzing the world around us. Uh, I think it's a wonderful thing when I go out with someone who knows the scientific names of different plants. Have you ever been with someone like that? A naturalist who really knows the woods, really knows the wildflowers, really knows the different kinds of trees. We've been with some people like that over the years, and it's just delightful. But there are times I just want to sit there in the woods and take it in. I don't want to analyze it. I don't want to know every single scientific name. I just want to think about the beauty and the intricacy of what's around me. So David doesn't make the mistake of just analyzing creation or analyzing the Old Testament. He makes the very wise choice of applying it, of, of applying it to his own life. Because he says there in verse 12, who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. He's thought about this awesome God of creation. He's thought about this God who revealed himself in his word. He's thought about God's requirements expressed in the law. And he realizes, even if I kept every single one of those laws, there are things in my life there are things in my life that, that I can fly under the radar. I can, you know, I could, I, could pull the, I could pull the wool over a lot of people's eyes in these areas. I could show everybody else how righteous I am before God. But really, in my heart of hearts, if I really sit and listen to you, Father, I know there are things in my life that I may not even be aware of where I'm falling short. Forgive my hidden faults. That's something we all need to be aware of because we, you know what? I've noticed this about human nature. <laughs> we, uh, we are a lot quicker to see other people's faults than our own. Isn't that amazing? Have you noticed that? And David says, forgive my hidden faults. He doesn't say, Lord, there's someone sitting three pews behind me, three people down, and boy, I wish they were listening to this sermon like I'm listening to it now because they really need this. No, he says, my hidden faults. And we all have them. We all have ways that we fall short of the glory of God. There are things that, we, that surprise us, if we're really honest, surprise us about our, our selfishness, or our pride, or our uh, quickness to judge other people. Hidden faults. Then he goes on to say, keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Willful sins. I think we could all admit there are times we know what we need to do. We know what God has said is the right thing to do or not to do. And we just put our chin out there and we say, well, you're entitled to your opinion, God, but I've got my mind made up. Most of us wouldn't want to, wouldn't want to admit that we've ever done that. But I think most of us can think about times in our lives when we knew exactly what we were doing when we took that step. And we did it anyway. 
And David said, those are the sins. Those willful sins are the ones that really have destructive power in my life. They also have the power to hook me because he says, uh, don't, may they not rule over me. When I willfully sin against God, I break, when I willfully break one of God's commands, it has the power to trap me, to shackle me. So we ask for God's grace to avoid those sins. He ends this psalm with a prayer of dedication. In fact, some people have, tra have translated that ver last verse, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. They've translated, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart. In other words, he, that last verse is a verse of dedication for this psalm. David is saying, Lord, this is what I've been thinking about. I put it down on paper. I put it down on this scroll. And, and this is the words you brought to my mind. Lord, um, I just present them to you as an offering. May it, really, may it really be from you. I think we would all agree he accomplished it. <laughs> that it really was from the Lord. Because it's endured all these millennia. And it still has the power to touch our hearts and minds. I think also that this closing prayer should be and can be something we pray every day. In fact, I've heard a lot of pastors begin their sermon by bowing, by bowing their head before they preach and they pray verse 14. Because when you preach a sermon, you're, you're preaching the meditations of your heart. And you're praying that your words have eternal impact and really represent the heart of God. And that's what really all of us want every day. What a fitting way for David to close this psalm that started in the distant fringes of the Milky Way and ends in his own human heart. The God of, of infinite intimacy. That's the God of Psalm 19.